magical force that allows for perfectly, you know, cyclical, uh, for example, the repeatable eclipse cycles in such a chaotic heliocentric system. If you think about it, it's really rather wild and chaotic, and you'd think that sitting on the Earth would be just a constant. Uh, roller coaster ride just being tumbled in all sorts of directions at all sorts of different conflicting velocities and then of course you have all these pulls of gravity from all these different giant sources of gravity that cause the giant sun to fly through space at half a million miles an hour but yeah no it's just because we're we're too stupid to understand it that's why Part two has a little bit more to do with shadows. If you have ever taken a ball, shined a flashlight at it, you'll see what kind of shadow comes off of it. And it actually comes out as a cone. And it gets big very fast. So with the distance of the sun and the height and size of the moon, which is only 23% the size of the earth, 2% of its volume and 1% of its mass, that the shadow that would be cast on the earth from the sun during a solar eclipse would be so huge it would wash out the entire earth not just one little segment. And also if you turn that and then say the light source on the earth that would be shined on the moon would be also very, very large, impossible to tell that there was any bit of curvature. And by curvature, I mean the curvature of the so-called shadow on the moon. Yeah, I totally agree with you and I, I see your point. This is something that I brought up a long time ago and of course got trolled for with all of the science parroting um, parrots. Yeah, it's, it seems like uh, light behaves in all sorts of uh, peculiar manners in order to favor the heliocentric theory. Because anytime you play with light and shadows, like, you know, take a flashlight and shine it to your hand a few inches away, well, that hand will be, you know, 50 feet wide on your wall. Well, that's because of the way that light operates. And yeah, you'd think that if the moon was blotting out the sun, then uh, it would cause one heck of a shadow, but no, it's all very much a local thing. And so, uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry to sound like a parrot, but I totally agree with you, and, and I've actually been um, bringing up this sort of argument since the beginning, and people are like, oh, don't you know anything about the umbra and penumbra? But again, that's all theoretical in order to make observations work in the heliocentric model. Um, those aren't facts, those are theories in order to explain away the uh, inconsistencies with the conventional wisdom. Now, if we wanted to get two household items and kind of take some tests on this, you could get a basketball, and then measure that out, and know that the moon, which is about the size of a baseball in comparison, is 30 Earth diameters away. So if we added 30 more basketballs in between the first basketball and the baseball, that would be the distance we're looking at. On my example, I only have 15 basketballs, so we'd have to add 15 more and then place the baseball. Then, using a light source, check the shadow that comes from the basketball. It's going to be like a cone heading out towards the baseball and it's going to completely engulf it totally. There will be no shadow of the basketball on the baseball 30 basketballs away. Uh, you're not going to get a curved shadow on the lunar eclipse and you're not going to get a spot shadow on the solar eclipse. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't you know this? Um, it's against the rules to falsify the heliocentric model if you want to prove the flat Earth. Just so you know, that's sort of a rule. Um, it's not good enough to falsify the heliocentric model, and in fact, according to some globbers, that's off limits, that's unfair, uh, we need to prove the flat Earth, but I'm sorry if the heliocentric model doesn't work, um, and the Earth is indeed flat, stationary, doesn't spin, doesn't orbit, then, you know, where, where do they go from there? I mean, I really think that the burden of uh, evidence or the burden of proof lies on the heliocentric team. Well, for one, because they are the mainstream sort of uh, paradigm. Uh, but for two, the entire heliocentric model has been falsified. And, you know, this is just another good example of how uh, light must behave in very peculiar and, and abstract and undemonstrable ways 
in order for the heliocentric model to work, especially in terms of eclipses. And uh, this this really isn't even scratching the surface on eclipses. On eclipses. And uh, God, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job playing devil's advocate, but uh, you know what can I say? You know, so far so good. No disagreements here. As we see in reality today. Uh, now you can see on the screen that I just switched. You can do it again with the baseball behind the light source and the basketball 30 basketballs away and you'll also see that that shadow wouldn't work the same as the shadow that we see in reality. And so that's about it. Pretty easy. Simply explain it to me. That's it. No need for insults. No need for name calling. I am coming to you saying I do not understand this. I don't know the answer. You all tell me that you do. So please explain it. And hopefully this goes smoothly. If it does, then I have several more questions I'd love to put out there and we'll get to the truth together. So be kind to each other. Don't lie to each other. And remember to open your mind because there's truth inside. This has been Jaronism. Until next time. Peace.